This chapter is all about how communities interact with one another and how they affect their ecological environment. Um, we're going to begin this lecture talking about mass extinction. A lot of this lecture pertains to the well-being of an ecosystem, and an ecosystem is made up of communities, and communities are made up of lots of various populations. Population is basically a collection of uh, many of the same organism. So if you have many of the same organism and you add to that lots of other kinds of organisms, it forms a community, and the way that communities interact forms an ecosystem. Now, there are times in history that scientists think that uh, a large percentage of organisms went extinct. So if we look in the record, this is mostly by analyzing layers of the fossil record and basically counting up how many different kinds of fossils there are and using that to form uh, an in extinction intensity index it looks something like the following so there are are five times that we see when we look at that record where uh, the diversity of species dramatically dropped from one layer to the next and scientists think that this was either because of a, a rising sea level, like something like a flood from ice caps melting, or um, you know, a volcano erupting and ash falling down, or a meteor hitting Earth, or any of these types of of things. But they note five particular uh, eras in which there was what they call mass extinction, and some people are arguing the case that um, we might be on the brink of a sixth mass extinction. They would argue that the impending sixth mass extinction is going to be wrought not from um, natural disasters, but from human activity. There's an organization called the World Conservation Union, and its French uh, name, the French acronym, is the IUCN. And they speculate that about 42% of amphibians, 26% of mammals, and 13% of birds, 40% of conifers are in danger of extinction. Now, some of the causes of extinction. Um, one is just simply habitat degradation. So clearing out forests and land for either um, logging, or in this case, we're seeing this is deforesting to create land for a palm oil plantation or clearing out land to build houses and housing developments, any type of activity where the forest, the natural habitat is uh, altered in some way would be habitat degradation. Another factor that could lead to extinction is introducing a new species into a population or into an ecosystem that could outcompete the native organisms living there. Uh, an example of this would be carp. Carp were brought in here in the 1970s by the United States Fish Commission as uh, a food fish, and what they were used for uh, were cleaning the ponds of commercial fisheries. So these types of fish are bottom feeders, so they, they eat stuff at the bottom of the food chain, small insects and protozoa and things like that. They don't really uh, feed on other types of fish and so they're great for cleaning a commercial pond uh, where you're actually trying to grow fish to sell the problem is that there's they're super good at eating <laughs> there's they're really good at out competing other fish for those uh food sources at the bottom of the food chain and then consequently indirectly organisms will become extinct because they're just out-competed. Not necessarily because the carp are eating them, but because they're being out-competed for resources. And these fish proliferate like crazy. And uh, just to give you an idea of how invasive they have become in regions of the United States, there is in Indiana a fishing tournament called the Redneck Fishing Tournament. And the rules are basically go out and kill as many carp as you can, but you can't use a fishing pole. So one of the things that's very pesky about carp is that they often uh, will jump out of the water. And so they can jump out and they can hit boaters and actually cause uh, 
uh, trauma to people if they get hit by them because I mean it's a big they can be a big old fish so uh, anyway without further ado here's the redneck fishing tournament and I knew it would be and I knew we needed a big trailer haul these things out because the water level's just right we're really proving how many of them around here just a little, little bitty shoot that's what this has all been all been about all these years to educate the public and public awareness of them and I think we've done a heck of a good job the first deed Hi, I'm Karen Williams Krista Pazogan Elisa Shaw come from everywhere every year at this tournament and I think with all the news publicity that we've had that that just adds to it yeah there's no you can't catch carb like this in California anywhere so okay it should just be a lot of fun Everybody, what these fish do, and not to let them in your rivers because once you do, it's too late. So, there you have it. There are all sorts of creative solutions to uh, ecological dilemmas, including the redneck fishing tournament. Okay, uh, the exploitation of species is another example or a cause of extinction. Um, a classic example of this is one that we've already talked about, but the northern elephant seal was uh, abundantly hunted in the mid-1800s to the late 1800s. And also uh, whales, any type of basically water animal that had a lot of fat on it, because what, why these organisms were killed as they're being, or why they were hunted as they're being, um, gathered for their blubber and the blubber was used to make oil this was back in the 15 or sorry the 1800s when oil was the primary energy source and so people if they wanted to have light in their homes they would have maybe a light fixture such as this one this one's been converted to electric but previously what would have been the case is that you would put oil in here you would light the flame and um and then you'd have a source of light for the evening. So big incentive there, which is why they were over hunted. And again, the statistics here on the Northern elephant seal are pretty dramatic, but they came all the way down to as few as 20 to 40 on the planet. And then they were able to fortunately bounce back. Okay, pollution is another uh, cause of extinction. One example of this is uh, kelp. So kelp, are really long um, they're actually a, a type of protease I believe but um, it's like an algae type protease but they are really 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 long uh, seaweed plants this is giant kelp so these can be anywhere from 70 to 80 to 120 feet long and they just have a thin attachment site at the bottom of the sea and uh, if the waters are polluted from runoff or whatnot, it can make their attachment points even weaker. And urchins can come in here and snip away at their stalks, and then it releases the kelp. And then before not long, you have what's known as a um, urchin barren. So you can see this was once, you know, this is what a kelp forest would look like after the urchins come in and uh, snip away all of the kelp. The kelp are valuable because they create a canopy or a place for organisms to hide. So it draws in uh, a lot of aquatic life. And you can see that when there is no shelter, there's less of an incentive for species to congregate in an area such as this, which is an urchin barren. Um, and just to highlight some of the nuance here in ecological systems, uh, there's another related 
component to this, and that's the sea otter. The sea otter eats the urchins, and when the sea otters are around, the urchins are the urchin population is kept in check, which means the kelp can flourish. So oftentimes in areas where there are big kelp forests, what people are looking for is the number of sea otters that are around because that will give some indication as to the how stable this ecosystem is. Okay, um, habitation destruction and fragmentation. There's what's known as a species area curve, and this is a figure from the textbook, which basically just shows that as the area increases, so does the amount of diversity. So this is um, a representation of data that was collected from studies on the uh, archipelago of West Indies, so basically a, a big collection of islands. And you can see each one of these dots is how big the island is. And then after surveying all the number of species found there, you can see that as the, the size of the island gets bigger, so does the number of species found on that habitat. And generally, species diversity is a good thing because it makes uh, the habitat more resilient. If everything is of the same species, uh, it makes the habitat much more fragile. A really good example of this is... Um, on the street where I bought my house, every single tree was an ash tree. Well, then along, you know, 40 years later comes the emerald ash borer. And so my wife and I walked out one day and we saw that there was a green stripe painted on every single tree on our street. And we were like, ooh, I hope green means good. <laughs> but green did not mean good. They came later and they chopped every single tree down and made our street look like a barren waste zone. So that's part of the reason why you never, you know, it's not a good ecosystem or an ecosystem where there's all of the same species generally is much more fragile to a crash. Since then, they've come and replanted uh, trees on my street, and now they're all varying types of tree. We have a coffee tree, and our neighbor has a hackberry tree, and um, there's going to be nice species diversity there, even on our uh, boulevard of our street. And so here you can see if the landscape is brought down 50% then uh, of what it of it used to be, then there isn't as big of a change. There's only about a 10% reduction in the number of species that were originally found there. And then if we bring this all the way to a 90% reduction, then we lose about half of the species that are found there. So curves that seek to study how the relationship between area and biodiversity exist, those would be called species area curves. According to that same organization, the World Conservation Union, if we continue to destroy habitats at the same rate that we are currently destroying them, um, nearly one-fourth of all living organisms will be lost within the next 50 years. So there's a little bit of cause there for concern. Okay, now oftentimes a bigger concern is not that the entire habitat would be destroyed, but generally what happens is that there is habitat fragmentation. So let's say this is an area of an ecosystem. It's generally not the case that the whole habitat is destroyed, but what happens is that somebody takes a chunk here, and then somebody takes a chunk here and does something with it. Somebody takes a chunk there, and somebody takes a chunk there. Somebody takes a chunk there and there, and so it gets broken up into a patchwork of different ecosystems over time. And this is particularly problematic because the bigger organisms, those at the very top of the food chain, generally require more broad and uh, large areas to roam. And so if it's all broken up like this, it's harder for them to live in the way that they're basically programmed to live. 
And if the top of the food chain is not present, then it means that some of the other underlying parts of the food chain can go unchecked. So there's some of the cause that for concern there for habitat fragmentation. Now, speaking of food chains, um, the way that a, a typical food chain looks is something like this. There's going to be the primary producers. These are the ones that are feeding the entire ecosystem. Ultimately, all of the energy gets traced back to the primary producers. And these are photosynthetic organisms. These could be um, terrestrial organisms or they could be aquatic organisms. Uh, in either case, though, it really does start with photosynthesis. It starts with energy gathered from the sun. Okay, the, all the different types of organisms that eat directly the primary producers would be called the primary consumers. And the organisms that eat those would be called the secondary consumers. And the organisms that eat those would be called the tertiary uh, consumers and so on and so forth. Uh, you could have quaternary consumers and keep going up and down the chain. But the one that's at the top is called the apex consumer. And if the apex consumer has been identified, then it's uh, a little bit easier to determine the well-being of the ecosystem because basically if the apex consumer is present, that means that there is a, enough robust production by the primary producers to sustain every single level of this food chain. If something happens and the apex consumer uh, disappears, well, that means that there probably wasn't enough secondary consumers to meet, to meet the needs of the tertiary consumers, which is why the apex consumers couldn't survive. And so it tells you that the all the way back down to the food chain, the amount of production that is happening in that system is no longer enough to sustain the entirety of the food chain. So ecologists might be concerned about studying uh, apex consumers for that very reason. It, it helps to provide some sort of insight there into the, the well-being of the food chain. Now, these are all called trophic levels. Every time uh, an organism consumes another organism, uh, that's underneath it this would be called a trophic level and you can organize these into what's known as a trophic pyramid and this is actually uh, a pretty important point there is a lot of energy that's lost between trophic levels okay so for example if um, you have some let's say uh, a meadow of grass and the sun is beating down on that grass and that grass is able to take all that energy okay then we're starting out with a hundred percent all right let's say let's say that um, a cow comes in and consumes that entire meadow well a lot of energy that was originally stored in those grass plants is lost when the cow is you know, undergoing its biochemical reactions and you know our bodies are pretty efficient at, at making energy from food but it's not that efficient not all of the energy is maintained there's a lot of energy lost um, in heat so as the cow is eating those grasses some of the energy in that grass is going to be stored on the cow as fat or milk or something but a lot of it goes just towards you know, keeping the animal alive, beating its heart, uh, activating its muscles. And as it, its heart beats and as its muscles contract, it releases heat. And as soon as that happens, that energy that was stored in the grass is now escaped into the atmosphere and we can't use it for anything. It, it goes away. And so it's generally thought that every time you go up a trophic level, you lose 90% um, into either heat or uh, into the decomposers. So when you think about, this is one of the arguments for people that are vegetarians. When you think about um, eating cows as a source of meat, what's happening in that example is that it could be the case that the cows are grass fed, which means that they would be primary consumers. And then we would eat the cows, so then we'd be secondary consumers. So 99% of all the energy that was originally stored in the plants is lost by the time it gets to us. Whereas if we were to just go ahead and eat the grass and 
not not grass, but let's say uh, some other green plant that's photosynthetic, like uh, like romaine lettuce or kale or something. Okay, then uh, we would be bearing with us 10% of the energy that was originally absorbed, not only just 1%. And furthermore, if it was the case that the um, the cows were fed uh, like a corn meal that was grown off of fertilizers from some other producer of some kind, then that would even make this even less. Okay. So that I do think, you know, when we think about the Genesis story about Adam and Eve, they were told that they basically ate plants. And that is because I think it's the most efficient way to um, consume energy. If we're eating an organism that's ate another organism, which is has consumed another organism underneath it, which is then the one that ate the uh, original photosynthetic organisms, there's just a lot of energy lost as heat. Okay, some of the consequences of extinction. One is that there would be a loss of resources. Uh, it's estimated that about eighty-seven billion dollars a year, or four percent of the United States of America um, gross domestic product is from wild species. So 4% is not a, a small number of the entire country's uh, productivity. So if we lose some of these wild species, then we actually lose a source of revenue that uh, feeds into the well-being of, of families in our country. Um, an interesting example of, of the loss of resource is that there's a plant called the rosy periwinkle, and this is grown in uh, Madagascar, which is thought to be a place where there's a lot of, of risk for uh, extinction. And it's actually used to isolate these two drugs here, which are uh, drugs that are tr used to treat and reduce the death rate in leukemia or um, lymphoma Hodgkin's. So there might be all sorts of medicinal properties or other interesting compounds and uh, wild plants that uh, we don't even know about yet. And so if they are lost due to extinction or habitat destruction, uh, due to extinction or habitat destruction, then we would lose our opportunity to study those plants and, and further our knowledge. Um, Okay, in an ecosystem, there are a couple different relationships that are shared between organisms, different relationships which are possible. One is mutualism, and that is um, when both members in the partnership are uh, benefited from their relationship with one another. So a great example of this are bees. Bees will take pollen, and they use the pollen uh, to make honey. Well, in the process, they get pollen on them, and then they go to another plant, and then when they're going around and tromping around that plant, they bring the pollen from one plant, and they bring it to another plant. Um, so they actually aid in fertilizing the flowers. And that's important because it requires the fertilization of the flower to make a seed, and then the seed is required to uh, reproduce the plant. At the same time, it's a great food source for bees, so a great partnership here. Another really classic example is just the relationship between animals and plants. Animals uh, release carbon dioxide as a byproduct, and plants release oxygen as a byproduct, so a great partnership is formed there. Okay, a couple other relationships. Uh, commensalism is when there is one party that is benefited, and the other one basically there's no effects. And then a third type of relationship would be uh, parasitism, which is basically the opposite of mutualism. This is um, where one party is benefited, but the other one is at a disadvantage. Okay, another type of ecological relationship is competitive exclusion. And this is an interesting one. Uh, basically, to sum this up, there's an interesting example here of salmonella. Uh, 
salmonella you've probably heard of it before but it's a it's a illness caused by the bacterium uh, salmonella enteroditis and to prevent this bacterium from being transmitted in generally it's uh, poultry products so raw eggs is typically the the main culprit and the thing that people are concerned about but also probably the meat I would think too just raw chicken meat well in either case uh, one of the ways that it's the risk of salmonella poisoning is reduced is by treating poultry with antibiotics but that introduces a whole host of other dilemmas because it cultivates or it adds to the cultivation of bacteria that are antibiotic resistant and we don't want to be cultivating a whole bunch of strains of bacteria that that antibodies don't work for anymore so another uh, example then is that people are using this principle of competitive exclusion to try and lower the risk of salmonella and so what they do is they actually will feed chickens something of a probiotic so they try and seed the gut with a lot of uh, normal bacteria salmonella is a bacterium that feeds in the and proliferates in the gut of a chicken and so if they f continually overwhelm the gut of a chicken with good bacteria then salmonella will always be out competed for resources there will be so most of the resources will be sucked up and used by the the sea of incoming bacterium that are perpetually coming in every day that uh, there just won't be enough opportunity for salmonella, salmonella to get an edge and actually start proliferating and forming a large colony to the point where it could uh, lead to sickness later on and in a more relevant probably and in another example this is also done to an extent in humans so this is clostridium difficile and maybe you've heard of a c diff um, infection before but this is type of the, kind of the same story people that have taken a prolonged regimen of antibiotics for some reason will have uh you know those antibiotics are good because they kill bacteria but they're bad because they kill bacteria uh there are are a lot of bacteria in your large intestine which are doing great things for you they're creating vitamins for you um, they're breaking down large complex molecules for you so you can absorb them better and so if somebody's on prolonged antibiotics because they have some sort of uh, infection somewhere or there's some need for them to be on an antibiotic well that those effects can also be seen in the gut where they can be destroying the normal healthy bacteria that live there well if all of that forest of bacteria are wiped away because of the antibiotics then if in the odd chance uh, this particular organism c diff these little rod shaped bacteria here if that gets there first and establishes a colony then it basically makes the rules and uh, it will start to outcompete the normal bacteria there and the more it grows think about it being almost like weeds in a yard the more that the weeds grow they can outcompete the grass and so they can stay and that's what c diff does and c diff releases toxins and all sorts of things that make people sick um, it doesn't have the same beneficial effects that the other bacteria do and so people can get really sick they can get tired they can get nauseated they can have diarrhea um, just because there's this prolonged battle for nutrients that is occurring all the time now one of the very interesting ways that c diff is cured remember it doesn't do us any good to try and get rid of c diff with antibiotics because that's what caused the infection in the first place um, so it's kind of the same story uh, in or, a, a way to treat c diff is to by trying to seed other bacteria in the colon so that they can then uh, so that they can then outcompete the c diff so they'll grow and then they'll outcompete and then slowly the c diff will die because they'll won't have the same abundance of nutrients they once had one of the way this is, one of the ways that this is done is a fecal transplant and so literally what is done is 
uh, somebody's fecal matter is donated. It's made into somewhat of a slurry. There's a tube that is inserted right up the anus and uh, some something like an enema, basically. The other, the donor's poop is basically washed into this person's colon and then it seeds the it seeds all of the bacteria there and i've seen i remember watching a video where somebody had been tired and ill and just feeling gross for months and they had no idea why they were so tired and why they were uh feeling sick and why they had pain in their in their abdomen they literally went in and had a fecal transplant and came out and within hours felt like they were totally a new person. So uh, it's a pretty powerful, robust treatment. And they are doing a lot of research, it, even at the U of M, of the, the different combination of bacterial species that would be really the best for seeding somebody's uh, gut. And so hopefully the idea is that somebody could just take like a pill or there would be like uh, like a little like tablet that's inserted up into the rectum and into the colon so that um, you don't have to like put a slurry of somebody else's fecal matter up into your body. That's not a lot of people are excited to sign up for that. Okay, but that's uh, in either case, that's uh, um, another example of competitive exclusion. Okay, now we briefly mentioned a keystone species. Uh, just wanted to come back and, and hit that again. Keystone species is any species that uh, holds the ecosystem together. And it's so named a keystone species. This keystone is the, the block at the top of an archway. And if this was to fall out, then the archway crumbles. So um, otters are an example of a keystone species, again, because they keep uh, the kelp forests alive by eating the urchins. Another keystone species are uh, wolves. Wolves are also an apex predator, so they are at the top of the food chain. But one could, an organism could be uh, an apex predator without being a keystone species, or vice versa. They could be a keystone species without being an apex predator. Uh, wolves are both. And so if the ecosystem is robust, then there'll be enough food to sustain wolves. And what they do is they actually um, hunt elk. And if they're not around, then the elk population can get out of control and the elk will actually uh, destroy trees with their rutting and their, um, the rutting and, and actually eating of small saplings and such. So the elk will destroy uh, the forest in a way. And if the forest is destroyed, then it starts to take a toll on the species that can live in that ecosystem. So it was interesting. They in Yellowstone National Park, they there was a big push to get rid of wolves because they were eating people's livestock. So they basically exterminated the wolf population, and then uh, many years later, in the 70s, they reintroduced the wolves. And uh, before they before they introduced reintroduced the wolves, they noticed that there was a bunch of populations of uh, trees waning. And then as soon as they brought the wolves back, those trees started to increase in their abundance, most notably because they were taking care of the elk. Okay, one final note here about um, energy and chemical flows basically how nutrients will cycle through an ecosystem. We talked a little bit about this already, but there's the producers, there's the consumers, there's the decomposers that bring it back, uh, the nutrients to the producers. And then anytime there is um, heat that is generated, it's lost and it can't be recycled back into the, the energy flow. One very important cycle is the nitrogen cycle and so I, this is one of there's a several different cycles there's the carbon cycle the nitrogen cycle the water cycle and a whole bunch of others but this is one that i want you to know because it is a very very commonly talked about cycle because it basically determines how plants grow
So plants are interesting because they have to use a certain form, most of them at least have to use a certain form of nitrogen. Well, the nitrogen that's in the air is uh, N2. It's diatomic, two atoms, diatomic nitrogen, N2. And most plants can't use diatomic nitrogen. Most plants have to use different nitrates and nitrites. So what happens is that atmospheric nitrogen, when it's struck with lightning, it turns into NO3. So it, it uh, lightning strikes the nitrogen and there's water in the air, so it's H2O, and there's oxygen in the air, so it basically adds oxygen onto uh, a molecule of nitrogen, and that makes a nitrate. That nitrate settles down into the soil, and then the plants can assimilate it and use it to uh, grow. This is also why you might notice that after a lightning storm, things look super green uh, because they're getting this extra infusion of nitrates from the atmosphere. Okay, there's a couple other ways, though, that nitrates can be um, gained. One is that uh, there are nitrogen-fixing soil bacteria. And there's also nitrogen fixing bacteria that actually live in the roots of plants. So that's like the, the plant's own little uh, chemistry factory in its roots. Um, this is generally in uh, legumes, so like soybeans, this happens. And so it's often why farmers will alternate between corn and soybeans, corn and soybeans, because the, the soybeans will bring the nitrogen back into the soil. Okay, um, the... Nitrogen fixing soil bacteria will take atmospheric nitrogen and they'll make ammonia from it. And then there's another set of bacteria called nitrifying bacteria, which will then turn that into nitrite. And then there's another type of bacteria called nitrifying bacteria, which will turn the nitrites into nitrates. So this is a little bit more of a longer process, which is why thunderstorms are good. It's a nice rapid infusion of nitrates into the soil. Um, Similarly, when a plant dies, it is decomposed generally by fungi or other types of, of bacteria, and then that will release ammonia, and then it, that can feed into this system as well. So generally the thing to know here would be that uh, atmospheric nitrogen is N2. It gets zapped to form nitrates, which are used by plants. But if that's not the case, there are bacteria which can convert it into ammonium and then into nitrates and then into nitrates. All right, that's going to wrap us up for chapter 16. A nice little short chapter there on um, ecosystems.